Hello, hello, Jeff Lerner here. How is everybody doing? Uh, today, I'm excited to be here as part of my ongoing commitment. I'm going live every day around this, uh, this time period, kind of mid-afternoon, late afternoon, my time here in Mountain Time. Um, let me know you're here. Feel free to uh, say hello. I see we got a bunch of people popping on on Instagram. Looks like uh, Facebook and YouTube are live as well. Uh, if this is your first time seeing me, my name is Jeff Lerner. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Entra Institute. I teach people in this world how they can have a more awesome life. I use entrepreneurial education as my vehicle to do that, but it's not because per se I'm committed to turning everybody into entrepreneurs. It's because I believe entrepreneurship is the best frame that people can uh put around themselves for becoming excellent, becoming uh, more awesome, having ultimately a more awesome life. Thank you, John. Thank you, Marie. Ali, nice to see you. And uh, anyways, I actually, I just got off a meeting. We were, uh, we're onboarding a new uh, director of customer experience inside of Entra, who's basically their focus is maximizing and optimizing the student experience inside of Entra. And, and we do that by defining the outcomes that we want and then putting processes in place to measure those outcomes. Hi, Patricia. Glad you're here. And um, it, it's as simple as saying, are, people, are people's lives getting better? It's not how much money are people making. It's not, you know, how many Jeff Lerner clones are we creating? It's not how many affiliate marketers have we flooded into the market. It's simply, are people's lives getting more awesome? Are people getting the vehicles set up in their life, whether it's just a, a transformed routine, it's a new schedule, it's new habits, it's a new business, it's new sources of cash flow, whatever it is. Are people getting the pieces in place in their life to live a more ridiculously awesome quality of life? I think that we live in a world right now that drastically needs a group of people to go model What's up, Christian? Appreciate you being here, man. The, the world needs us to go model excellence. It doesn't need us to be waiting and hoping that our life gets better. It needs us to go model exemplary, driven, excellent living. Marie, I'm glad your husband is here. I have much love in my heart for musicians, people that create. Creation is one of the currencies of professional excellence that we talk about along with authority, and finance, we have a, a deeply defined framework for how to create more value in this world so that you can extract more value inside of your own life. If you're here and you believe this is a message that the world needs as I do, please, please, please give me a like, give me a heart, give me a share. Like, let the world know what's happening here. We, we, have, we have blown up a movement here. We have tens of thousands. I think we're nipping at 60,000 students that have come through our curriculum. Jeff, what's up, my man? Appreciate you being here. We have something close to 60,000 students that have been through our curriculum. We have a group, Facebook group, over 10,000 strong. We have a, a really expanding uh, you know, footprint online, socially, in terms of our content consumption. I'm telling you, there is a demand, there is a need and a hunger in this world to just be better, not to ask for better, not to hope for better, but to be better, to produce better so that we can have a better life. We create a better life. A lot of people, I think, in this world are, are kind of waiting for their external circumstances to get better and, and, and failing to appreciate the extent to which our external circumstances are simply a reflection of what we are building and forging internally and putting out into the world. That's how the world works. That's how life has worked for thousands of years. But in the modern world, there are tools. There are opportunities, tools, and an entire paradigm around the new economy, around the flow of capital, around digital technology, around a change in the consumer market, around how the world functions now in terms of business that gives 
the average person an unprecedented opportunity to create an extraordinarily awesome quality of life. I believe it. The reason I believe it is because I have lived it. In fact, I'm going to show you something. This is my tax return from 2008. I have it framed on my wall. This is when I first discovered the digital economy. This is when I first went online and said, I don't just want to have better. I want to be better. I want to do better. I want to produce more value in the world. And I want to learn how to take what I produce and multiply at times the power of the reach that we can get on the internet. Wadi, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for being here. Christian, my man, if I haven't said hello, glad you're here. Let's see what's going on on Instagram. Oh, wow, the Instagram comments got hung up, but they are just flying through. So many people on. So this is my tax return from 2008, the year I hit rock bottom. Check out this number in the bottom corner. Let me see. I'm going to show it on Instagram first. Can you see that? That's a negative. That's a negative number. Negative 40,516. Look at that on Facebook and YouTube. Look at that. Negative 40,516. And by the way, uh, the person who says we want you on our podcast, I actually just sent a message to our internal team and said to get back to you with a yes. We would love to be on your podcast. What's up, my man, Aaron Parkinson, one of the original participants in the incipients. What's the word? The oh, man, I'm so beat. I can't think of the word. It's only Monday and I'm already tired. Um, the original impetus for this movement. It's not even a company. It's not a platform. It's not a program. It's not a system. It's a movement based on a vision. And I'm going to come back to that tax return, by the way. Based on a vision, our vision statement says, we believe in a world where an awesome life is achievable for anyone committed to excellence. Our mission statement is to empower that excellence across the three key areas of life, physical, personal, and professional, to empower people to achieve physical, personal, and professional excellence through entrepreneurial education. Again, like I said, entrepreneurship is simply a mechanism to allow you to become excellent in your life. And I promise you, when you get excellent enough, when you manifest over time, not just for a day, but over time, a commitment to excellence in a prolonged way across the, the, the time and space of your life, you will wake up one day and go, oh my gosh, how did my life get so awesome? And that's, I'm saying that as a person who 12 years ago, this was my reality. I took a loss that year, filed a negative $40,000 tax return. And listen, I'm a pragmatist, okay? I'm under no illusion that people want to make money. You know, everybody wants to feel better. Everybody wants to look better. Everybody wants to have better relationships. Everybody wants to have more confidence. But man, if we could just have some more cash, how much easier would all that stuff be? And uh, I, I, you know, I believe it. I, I was in 2008. I was in I was in an all time low. That was my tax return from that year. And I I went online, just as many of you have done, just as many of you who have found Entra have done. I went online and I found a community co created actually by my friend Aaron, who's who's here with us uh, watching, and. This community was a group of people who I would suggest were not so committed or passionate about internet marketing or copywriting or building sales funnels or, you know, hawking products on the internet. Those were simply the, the you know, the, the pieces of the machine that they built, but it was because they were committed to a way of being in the world. And I was so blessed in late 2008, right after I had filed, or, or I guess I guess it was right before I filed that tax return, summing up what was basically the worst year of my life. And I was suddenly exposed to this world where it was like, whoa. And you know, to quote Jim Rohn, it's not about making life easier. It's about getting better. Right? Hey, Brian, appreciate you being here. And uh, I was exposed to this world 12 years ago, and I've simply been evolving into it ever since. 
getting better every single day. And I have found now, you know, you wake up one day and exactly like I said, like, I'm not saying this in a vacuum. I'm not saying this in the abstract. I'm not saying this is a hypothetical. I'm saying you get committed enough to excellence. You get a balanced excellence going in your life. You start taking better care of your body. You start feeding your body and mind different things. You start speaking differently to your loved ones, changing the dynamic in your relationships in this world. And you start changing the way you approach your work. You get more methodical. You get more disciplined. Frankly, you get extreme. You get extreme as hell. You get off-puttingly and frighteningly extreme to, to most people. Most people that are just kind of like, you know, settling and, and plotting through life with the average as an acceptable standard. You become alienating to those people, not, not intentional, not as a way of being superior or posturing or being better than, but simply because you decide excellence is the only way. And when you make that decision and you sustain it over time, you will wake up one day and go, oh my God, what happened? It was such a day when I decided to create Entra because I said, this is, this is ridiculous. A broke musician who simply decided that he was going to live better. He was going to be more disciplined. He was going to be more consistent. He was going to be more focused on the things that matter and that move the needle in this world. And he was going to start eschewing and rejecting everything else, all the crap that most people settle for as the base, as the base of their life, the core content of their life. It's like the, the food and the nourishment of their life. Most people settle for, most people settle for living, you know, building their body off of McDonald's and Burger King. And I started rejecting all of that. And I'm not talking just about food. I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about pointless distractions. I'm talking about unsatisfying relationships. I'm talking about uh, career endeavors that aren't leading me on a trajectory towards where I want to go. I'm talking about patterns of communication that don't create, that don't engender reciprocity and connection and the positive feelings in the person that I'm speaking to. I'm talking about rejecting all of it wholesale, getting extreme getting fanatical, getting crazy by most other people's assessments. And you will wake up one day and realize, hey, I rejected what most people accept. Therefore, I no longer have what most people settle for because most people, what they accept, you get what you tolerate, right? They tolerate mediocrity. They tolerate the mundane. They tolerate the average and they have mediocrity. And they have the mundane and they have the average. And I've started rejecting it aggressively, unapologetically. And one day what I realized is when you, when you reject all that stuff, you create a vacuum into which excellence can be, can be pulled. It's not a push. It's not an effort anymore. It's not about willpower. It's no longer about forcing change. You reject all the average in your life and you create a vacuum that becomes a pull mechanism. Suddenly, excellence becomes the oxygen that fills the void in your life. I promise you, I promise you, I'm 41 years old. I got more money in the bank. I got less fat on my body. I got a better marriage. I got beautiful kids. I got everything. And what, what I have done, what I have decided, and I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to encourage you to do this too. Don't apologize. Don't hide. Don't be insecure. Make your life so good that you're not embarrassed for people to be looking at it because the, you know what the world needs? The world needs examples. It's human nature. We hear these ideas in the abstract. We hear these, these beautiful, you know, these things sound good and they, they get published on these quote cards. But unless you own it at a visceral, gut-wrenching level, and you do that wretchedly hard work, nothing's going to change for you. But then when you do, you become a beacon of hope to so many people around you. And then you have an obligation. Thank you, Mason. Yeah, I love this shirt too. Great band. In fact, Jacqueline, as an aside, Jacqueline and I, we've been like chilling at night, kicking it in our bed, just listening to like 90s grunge lately and talking and hanging out. It's like throwback to our childhood. And it's been so good, man. We've been rocking Pearl Jam. We've been rocking Nirvana. We've been rocking Alice in Chains. We've been rocking Stone Temple Pilots. So fun. Anyway, but I'm telling you guys, like when you commit and you say, I'm going to stop apologizing. I'm going to stop settling. I'm going to be willing to be controversial and unappealing to the majority out there 
and I'm going to create this vacuum in my life that'll be filled with excellence. And then I'm going to put that shit on display. I'm going to put it out there so the whole world can say, can see, hey, this is what happens when you make a radical shift because they need it. The world needs it, man. The world needs it bad because they're not just going to take your word for it. They're not listening to what you say. They're watching what you do. And then it becomes momentum. Then it becomes inertia. Then it becomes hypocrisy if you back down. Once you commit to excellence, once you start pushing in that direction, you don't get to take a day off. You don't get to back off. What kind of leader are you? And I'm talking leadership of self, leadership in your own life. What kind of leader are you if you back off of excellence once you commit to it? Because especially once you've put yourself out there and people are watching and you've declared publicly to the world, I am getting better. Now people are tuned in and going, hey, is this guy going to pass or fail? Is this guy going to come out the other side or is he going to do what most people do? Is this just a New Year's resolution that's going to you know, fall off track in February? That's how most people are. You got to put yourself out there. Thank you so much for saying how much you've enjoyed the Entre training. I appreciate that. Put yourself out there. Get the world watching. Commitment and consistency principle tells us we do not like appearing as hypocrites publicly. We say what we put on display, we naturally backfill with, with behavioral changes because we don't, want, we don't want to be called out. We don't want to be called out. We don't want to go public and say, you know what? I just smoked my last cigarette and I just ate my last cheeseburger and I just had my last condescending conversation with my wife. You, you put that stuff on your Facebook status and I promise you tomorrow, you're going to think twice before you pull out a cigarette. You can go, man, I just, what if somebody takes a picture? What if somebody takes a picture of me smoking when just yesterday I told the world that I smoked my last cigarette? What if, what if somebody records me? What if somebody happens to overhear me being an asshole, being a bastard, you know, talking down to people? I just declared that I'm not going to condescend anymore. You start declaring, publishing, broadcasting to the world. What, what you're all about, and you create a natural, a, a natural inertia. It's, again, it's the difference. This is how you overcome willpower. There's, everybody always talk about willpower. I got to work on my willpower. Jeff Montreal just said, over a month, no smoking. Since he got involved in this training, it's nothing I did. It's nothing I did. It's something he heard the wisdom, the truth of what I'm saying, and said, hey, I'm going to make these commitments, and I'm going I'm to declare it out to the world. And now, Jeff, I'll let you, I'll let you answer the question. I, I know your story, but I'll let you answer because I know you're you're typing on Facebook right now. How long had you smoked? How long had you smoked before you made that that commitment, that declaration to self? And guys, this stuff works. This stuff works. And look, Mother Teresa, she said, "Not everyone can do great things, but everyone can do small things with great love." She said, want to make, you know, are you upset? I forget exactly what she said. But she said, are you obsessed with world peace? Want to be a, an advocate for world peace? Go home and love your family. That's what Mother Teresa said. And I think in that say, you know, we can take that philosophy, say it's not about, you know, creating a, 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 you know, a movement like she did or founding a new church or, you know, doing something that gets media press, you know, exposure and, it's, it's about doing the small things with great love, with great excellence, with great commitment, and not being shy. You know, one of the things I say, people talk about modesty. People use the word modesty as a substitute. Hey, babe, so glad you're here, always. And by here, I mean on this live and also just in my life. People use the word modesty as a, as a euphemism, as a substitute for being shy and insecure to, make, to, to try to paint it as a positive, to try to paint it as a, as, a, as a positive attribute of character. Modesty is cool. You don't want to be braggadocious. You don't want to be obnoxious. You don't want to be off-putting uh, off in a way that's a, about intentionally trying to make people feel less than. But calling shyness modesty 
as a way to try to paint it as an asset, that's just self a world where the tools are in place that allow you to broadcast your values and create a standard that you will naturally rise to because you know people are watching and say, well, I'm too modest. I don't, I don't want to show off. It's not showing off. It's just showing. Show yourself. Be seen. The most terrifying part of human existence is to be truly seen as we are because we know. It's called shame. We all carry it. We're all afraid of what it looks like. We're all afraid of what we look like. But when you commit, when you, when you decide unequivocally in a boat burning, no going back fashion, that you're going to be excellent and you're going to allow your excellence to be visible to the world, you become that agent of change that Mother Teresa is talking about. Not everyone can do great things, but everyone can do small things with great love. I believe not everyone can necessarily create a movement of excellence. I mean, humbly and blessedly, I, I've actually, you know, been in the right place at the right time in a world that was so hungry for it that I was able to speak that word excellence and get traction with it. But not everybody needs to go out and create a movement for excellence. Create a habit of excellence in your, in your life. What is it that Will Durant said writing about Aristotle? It's a quote that often gets attributed to Aristotle is that uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not a virtue, but a habit. Say that again. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not a virtue, but a habit. How are you showing up today? How did you wake up today? Did you lay in bed? Did you, did you snooze? Did you hit the gym? How's your body feeling today? How's your metabolism today? Have you burned more calories than you've consumed or at least parity? Or are you, are you softening? Are you regressing? Are you backsliding with your commitments in your life? Neo, I appreciate it. Man, same to you, brother. Keep changing lives. Beautiful work that you're doing, man. So honored to even just get to be a follower of yours, man. Tremendous what you do. Are you moving backwards or are you moving forward? You're either growing or dying, man. Second law of thermodynamics, principle of entropy. Look it up. Energy in a system decays. Things break down over time. It's, it's the creative life force of the world that assembles and that builds. You know, call it the God energy, call it what you will. It's what grows a tree. But then what happens when we let nature take over? What happens to that tree when the simple laws of nature and the laws of physics get applied to that tree after its creative life force starts to burn out? It decays. The leaves then the twigs, then the branches, then ultimately the trunk itself break down and become nothing more than tiny little particles in the soil waiting for new creative life force to grow another tree, right? Be the creative life force in this world. Grow your own damn tree. Reject the law of thermodynamics. Reject entropy. Don't be subject to what happens when you let up. You back off an inch. And you start to decay. You are growing or dying. You are testing yourself every day or you are failing the test of life itself. That's a fact. That's not my opinion. It's not even my belief. It's just straight up the world. It's the universe, right? Anyway, so this, this live is supposed to be about how to choose a business partner. And I, and I am going to talk about that. I just, I always got to get on my, my crusade, you know, right out of the gate. Guys, this stuff, this isn't what I believe. It's not what I do. It's, it's who I've become through repetition and rejection of anything that isn't congruent with it. That's the key, man. How do you, mm, how do you get as serious as you need to be just to, just to not suck in this world? You got to get nuts. You got to get nuts, man. I'm unapologetic. If, if this whole exercise in the last couple of years has done anything for my life is to, is to remove the fear and the shame associated with being so effing out of my mind that I won't apologize for the fact that I'm going to be excellent or I'm going to be dead. I would, I would literally, I, like, I, I think back to my life, like, what would it be like to go back? First of all, just using the term excellence in reference to ourselves might sound pompous. It might be something you're, you're, you're reticent to do. It might be something you're like, oh, I can't describe myself as excellent. How, how arrogant would I be? That's, 
Excellence is a decision. It's a commitment. If you've committed to it, it's like I declare myself, you know, uh, a dad I, because I decided to marry a woman with and become a dad. I've chosen the role of father in my life so I can say I'm a father. I've chosen the role of excellence in my life so I can say I'm excellent without embarrassment, without shame. Can you? And I'm not saying that in a, in a diminutive, like a, a, a not dim, pejorative. I'm not saying, are you excellent? Like, eh. no, I'm saying like, are you excellent? Have you decided to wear that as a, as a tattoo? Excellence tattooed on your, your body and your soul and your life and your habits. And is it showing up in your habits? If it's not showing up in your habits, it's not showing up in your life. Don't kid yourself. It's not enough just to apply it to yourself as an adjective. It's got to, you've got to apply it to yourself as a, as a habit. You've got to apply it to yourself as a day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, second by second discipline. And when you do, everything changes. Everything. Thanks, Parky. Good nuts. Jeff says, I put on the excellence mantle as soon as I wake up. It guides my decisions. That's right, man. That's why we see the change. You get in the Entrenation group and you scan the group and you scan the posts and you can see the people that are still kind of flirting with it, the people that are still kind of trying it on and the people that, that have said unequivocally, I'm excellent. Today is day one and every day after is day two of my excellent life. When you see that, you can see it in people. You can see the change. You can feel the change. You see it in their eyes. You can hear it in their voice. You can feel it in the energy and the, the heat coming off their body. Excellence. It's the only way. It's the only way. And, and, and if, you don't, if you don't believe, you know what, believe me, go look around. Go to Walmart. Go to the DMV. Go to the airport. Go to a sporting event. Go to any place where a large number of people congregate. And look around and say, does this place just, just exude excellence? Is the, is the atmosphere in this building just steeped with excellence? And it will be a hard no. It will be a disappointing no. There will be a smell in the air, and it is not the smell of excellence, especially the DMV, right? No, oh, man, most people, they just, ah, they're just plodding along one step after the other. And you can choose. And here's the thing. This isn't a condemnation. This isn't a criticism. Today can be the first day. You can be 85 years old. I've coached a 96-year-old woman. I helped a 96-year-old woman who, was, who had either been taken care of, and she was an amazing woman. I mean, she, was, she was sweet. I wouldn't say she had embraced excellence, but she had definitely embraced sweetness and empathetic communication. She was very kind, but she had not stepped into her greatness. She was 96 years old. And I said, let's Let's do something a little different. You spent your whole life being either taken care of by your husband or taken care of by the system. Her husband had passed away. She was living off of, I guess, her husband's pension and social security, whatever. I said, let's, let's flip this script here. You're 96 years old. How about we start with excellence? And we, we get, she, oh man, she, she struggled. She fought. She fought the great fight for a couple of years until she passed away. But those last couple of years of her life, she built an online business. She replaced her social security income with passive income that she created online through affiliate marketing. She created a blog. She started publishing content. This was almost 10 years ago when I was getting started. I coached this woman. And she lived more in those last couple of years, more, more uh, self-determined living, more empowerment, more in control of her own circumstances than she'd ever been in her life. And you know, I've been, I was thinking about it today. I like, I don't think it's just, I don't think it's just a convenient perspective for me to say that if you are reliant on anyone else for your well-being in this world, you are one variable that is outside your control away from having your entire life crumble. How people talk about security. How is there any security in that? How is there any security in being like, well, I'm one economic vicissitude or I'm one you know, corporate decision, or I'm, I'm one bad day or bad week. I'm one major medical problem away. I'm one X away from having my entire life crumble. And yet in their minds, in our minds, we're tempted to believe 
that there's security in that. Why? Because when we love the idea that, that it's not up to us. We love the idea that it's not up to us. Giovanni, thanks for being here, my friend. We love that idea that it'll be okay even if I'm not in control. Not the truth. It ain't okay. If you're not in control, if you're not the one controlling your own means of production and creation in this world, you're, you're, you're one non-controllable variable. And so away from total collapse, there's this principle, man, I'm really on one today. There's this principle called self-efficacy, right? Self-efficacy says, I should only apply my energy and resources to things that I have maximum control over, right? <laughs> Whack Mexican dude, those, those hearts are not spam, man. You can't spam hearts. You're just sharing the love, brother. Spam away. Give me the hearts. I appreciate that. Listen, like think about that. Self-efficacy. I should only apply my resources, my time, my energy, my thoughts, my creativity to things that I have maximum control over. Why did I pick entrepreneurial education as the vehicle to empower people to achieve physical, personal, and professional excellence based on a vision that says anyone committed to excellence can achieve an awesome life? Why did I choose entrepreneurial education? Because it's about getting control. If you're not in control, you're putting your time and your energy and your resources and your creativity and your industry into things you can't control. That's the opposite of self-efficacy. Basic psychology teaches us that investing our energy into things that we can't control and over which we don't primarily drive the outcome is wasteful. And yet the current model, the current operating model of the world says that we should spend the bulk of our creative energy working on things that we ultimately don't have determining control over. So basically, we live in a world that contradicts basic psychology. A lot of, I agree, excellence is awesome, especially when you balance it. We live in a world that contradicts basic psychology. I'm going to explain all that again. Basic psychology says, don't apply your energy to things that you don't control. But then the world says, give me your energy and hope for a paycheck. Give me your energy and hope for love. Give me your energy and hope for health. Nah, it's craziness, it's craziness. This is, why, this is why you have to be crazy to get control. This is why you have to be crazy to get excellence because you're cra crazy is in the eye of the beholder. They'll think you're crazy because actually they're crazy. They're crazy. The world is nuts. The world is off their rocker. Say my name. JXSU23. I don't actually know your name. I just know your Instagram handle. That's like from a, what's that from? That's from a movie. Say my name. I can't remember the movie, but anyways, there you go. D and Tom Alato. Appreciate you being here. Sarmite. Appreciate you being here. Inspire. Local door. Appreciate everybody being here. Like th really just like, let that sink into your bones for a minute. The world tells us to rely on it for our well-being. But by definition, the world is something we can't control. What we can't control is our own industry, our own efforts, our own production. And yet the world tells us that our own efforts and our own production are not a reliable source of control and well-being in our life. It contradicts the fundamentals of human nature. No wonder the world's so screwed up. No wonder people are running around all pissed off right now, realizing they got sold a raw deal because they put their stock, they, they put their future, they put their whole okayness into a system, into a construct that by definition disempowers them. I'd be pissed too. The reality is if somebody hadn't woken me up to this, years ago, I'd probably be out in the streets right now pissed off too. Instead, I might seem pissed off. I'm not pissed off. I'm, a, I'm, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm a, I'm a glowing fountain of joy because of this truth. Pull it in. Circle the wagons. You know, Ayn Rand gets a lot of flack in the, 
in in you know sort of the 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 academic circles out there because the academic circles are all subsidized by the government and they just want to believe that oh we just need to we just need to crank out employees to go plug into the industrial system. Wanda says, I wrote this down. Do not put your energy in things you can't control. Amen. By the way, it's an election right now. It's a political season and people are really hot. They're really pissed. They're really, everybody's got a lot of opinions about things that they can't control. You know who couldn't care less? This guy. If I want to, if I want to have control in a political context, I'm going to on that. I'm trying to work on like closing loops when I go live. I tend to run off on these tangents and I don't, I don't close the loop and then I deviate to another one, but I'm working on that. So I'm going to circle back to the Ayn Rand thing. But here's the thing. If I want to have control in a political context, I should run for office. I should put my money where my mouth is. I should put my time where my mind is. I should actually go do the hard work that actual politicians have done Politicians are the only people that should even bother having political opinions because they did the work to get themselves in a position where their opinions can actually translate into a meaningful say in the creation of policy. Why are we all so worked up? We don't make the laws. We don't have a freaking one iota of a say in the policies that get enacted, but we will argue them till we're blue in the face. Beep, 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 beep. My opinion, no, your opinion, no, my opinion, no, your opinion. And yet no one is actually, I mean, in that conversation, neither party actually has any control, any value in the actual policies that they're bickering about. Why the hell are they so preoccupied with it? If you want to care so much, back it up with work, back it up with focus, right? I don't care. I'm not going to find me engaged in political dialogue because I have no say in the matter because I haven't chosen to put my energy towards running for office. And the day I want to make an impact, I will, and you'll know. And I think everybody should operate the same way. Focus on the things you can control. That's why entrepreneurship is so awesome. Entrepreneurship is basically a synonym for getting control in your life. That's why I love it. That's why I teach it. That's why I live it. I was talking about Ayn Rand. Now, she has a book called The Fountainhead. And the fountain, the concept of the fountainhead basically says, mankind is the wellspring, the fountainhead from which all human achievement springs. We think that it comes from, go ahead, Owen, ask your question. We think that it comes from our, you know, our employers. We think it comes from our government. We think it comes from our country. We think it comes from our world. It, look, it, whatever you believe about God, some created, some creation being, some force out there, maybe it's the universe, maybe it's physics, maybe it's whatever. I, I'm not here to tell anybody what to believe, but it put into us an energy, a creative ability and drive to go make an impact in the world, right? We are the wellspring of all human achievement and all human creation. Whack Mexican dude, I appreciate you being here. Feel free to come back and finish the stream. Definitely go do, go dry your laundry. We are the wellspring. So shouldn't we focus our energy on things that allow that fountain to runneth over, so to speak, and do nothing else? That's the key. It's not like, oh, well, I, I went to the gym today. I spent an hour getting empowered. I spent an hour getting in control of my life. Yeah, but what'd you do with the rest of the time? Did you reject disempowerment? Did you reject a lack of control for the entire 16 or 18 or 20 hours that you were awake? However long you were awake, did you reject disempowerment the entire time? Somebody comes up to you speaking a disempowered language. You offer them perhaps, you, you first of all, don't offer unsolicited advice. Are you open to some feedback? If they are, Perhaps share your perspective, but if they persist, you leave. Do you reject it at every turn? Disempowering food, disempowering ideas, disempowering media, disempowering relationships, disempowering habits, disempowering work, which sadly most people's jobs primarily consist of disempowering work. And I know we gotta, we gotta do what we gotta do to make ends meet again why I chose entrepreneurial education. It was the one thing you can do to simultaneously develop empowerment and build the fortress 
that allows you to start rejecting disempowerment because it's really hard to be empowered when you're desperate and hungry and you need a paycheck and you can go take the shit that everybody wants to shovel at you in exchange for the money to buy your food. That's why you need to be an entrepreneur. It's actually the only structural way to build a foundation in your life that allows you to take a 24-7, 365 position of rejecting disempowerment non-negotiably because as long as you're depending on someone else, to some degree, you're subject to what they tell you and how they tell you you need to be. You're, you're, you're tra- people think they're trading time for money. You're trading empowerment for money if you're relying on other people. Become an entrepreneur when I was 16 years old. And I woke up one day. Actually, I didn't wake up. I'll tell I I remember it clear as day. I'm glad you asked that question. By the way, Owen, you never asked your question. I'm, I'm still happy to answer it. I was sitting in an abandoned music building at a boarding school in oh, what was it? Uh, Northfield, Massachusetts. So I had dropped out, or I Frank I actually got kicked out uh, of my high school sophomore year because I recognized they were. They were inculcating me to become a little, you know, a little drone. And I, 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 because I rejected that, they actually booted me out of this private high school. So there I was at a boarding school uh, during my, the fall semester of my junior year of high school. And I, instead of going to class because I was sick, I skipped class and I was in an old music, uh, an old abandoned music building playing a piano and there was no one else in the building because they had moved all the other pianos and all the students over to this new building. And I was sitting there by myself, teaching myself to play Moonlight Sonata on the piano, like deciphering the, and that's in C sharp minor. It's four sharps. It's kind of thorny, minor key. And I'm sitting there teaching myself and I was like, I'm truly happy right now. I'm truly in my lane of satisfaction. And you know what's terrifying is that I've got a few years left. And if I don't figure out a way to stay in my lane, essentially to cement control of my own life, I'm going to have to get a job and I'm going to have to start a multiple decades long journey of, of progressive disempowerment that most people accept as a trade for their okayness in life. And it hit me so hard. And I actually, at the time, I thought that God was speaking to me saying, Jeff, you need to become a musician. You need to play the piano. You're happy right now. You could make a life out of this. And so I wouldn't say that's when I knew that I was going to become an entrepreneur, but effectively a musician is an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur means someone who goes out, it's entreprendre. It's two French words, entre and prendre. By the way, why I why my company is called Entre Institute. Entre uh, means <sighs> entreprendre. Man, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on the French, but basically entrepreneur means someone who swims out into the ocean, grabs something of value like a fish or a buoy, I don't know what you drive, go out into the ocean and grab, and then swims back to shore to give the value to all the people who weren't willing to brave the dangers of swimming out into the ocean. That's actually the French etymology root of the word entrepreneur. And in that sense, I knew that from, from the day I had that epiphany when I was 16 years old. So somebody is asking, I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna take this question seriously. By the way, I do realize I'm supposed to be talking about how to pick the right business partner, but you know what, this is my show. Sometimes I get to decide where we go with it. Somebody says, I'm 17 and I'm in a gang. I'm from the state of California and I'm, I'm in a gang named Jar. The only way out is death. How can I leave? I'm going to treat that like a serious question and assume that, um, that it's not like a you know, big joke or something. I mean, it's, it's a very extreme situation uh, that you're describing. Man, that's hardcore. Uh, I, I think you said you're 17. I mean, listen, I, first of all, I, I can't, I'm going to say I can't give specific advice in that context because it sounds like the stakes are way higher than anything that I would want to advise. But I can say what I would do in that situation is I would do anything I could to leave. I would play along. I would, I would gather resources. 
you know, first of all, get, maybe get a job. Uh, I'm not saying you don't have one, but like focus on work. It's, you know, I got to imagine the gang can't be like, if you're like, look, I got to go to work. I got to make money. They're not going to be like, you know, you're disrespecting the gang by, by going to work. I mean, even gang members have to eat, right? Just focus on the work, focus on accumulating as much resources as you can. And as soon as you're able, I just get the hell out of there, man. Again, I, I can't, um, I can't speak too much to that situation, but you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta just change your environment. That, that's, I'll, I'll say this, you know, when I was in a circumstance, a really low point in my life, I was surrounded by a, a lot of people who, you know, kind of thought I was a loser, thought I was, you know, an embarrassment, thought I'd let a lot of people down. And the best thing that happened to me in many ways was this massive calamity in my life, the massive debt, you know, this tax return that you see here, filing, ne making negative income. <laughs> You're saying somebody's trolling. I, hey, you know what? I'm just going to answer the question. Look, Jeff living in, you know, his nice house, doesn't know gang culture. And I'm just, maybe I am being trolled. I'm still going to, there's value in my answer. Um, hopefully, because I know there's value in it because there's value in the lesson that sometimes you just got to, change your circumstances. And when I was at such a low point that basically people reject, I did think jar was a strange name for a gang, by the way, that at least did land with me. But, um, I, I was at such a low point that because I basically got rejected by the people around me, it actually was liberating because it, it essentially forced upon me a, a removal of negative circumstances, of negative energy. And uh, that's that's what I would I would recommend to anybody that needs to change their circumstance. Even if this one person, that's not a real circumstance. The reality, I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of stories. I, we have 20 plus advisors in our company who, who gather with us every week and share with us stories and experiences and what they're hearing from people out there who are very serious and very desperate to make changes in their life. And whether that one scenario was concocted or not, the reality is there are a huge number of people, you know, Marie points out about people in abusive relationships. There are a huge number of people out there who are in circumstances that make it very, very difficult for them to pursue their goals and to better their life. And, and, and to Marie's point, you play along in the most selfish way possible. You're not playing along for their benefit. You're playing along for your own. It's about self-preservation. It's about accumulation of resources with the singular objective of being able to make a break for it. And by the way, that's exactly how I would describe having a job. Don't quit your job to go start a business and put yourself in dire straits when you have no money and you're going to become desperate and it's going to compromise your decision making. Now play along, show up every day, play the game, smile, go to the meetings, save your money, reduce your, co your cost of living, reduce your, your expenses until you have enough of a capital base that you can at least deploy it into a business and start to build your exit ramp for your life. Robert Kiyosaki changed my life and Jeff, you inspire me the same way he did. Thank you. You know what's funny? Reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was in my, uh, maybe mid, early to mid 20s, Changed my life too. So, you know what? Let me, uh, <laughs> oh, now, now Jar is looking for me. I think I'm, I think I'm supposed to be scared. Um, you know, I'm going to bite my tongue. And the one in a hundred chance, one in a thousand chance that there is really some gang called Jar. I guess I'll just not say anything provocative. Happy Canadian Thanksgiving. Amen. I was just on the, uh, in a meeting with a Canadian who had to go because he had Thanksgiving dinner. Um, Anyway, so I, I do want to touch on the the predetermined subject for this live because it's actually really, really important now that we're, you know, we're talking about starting a business and it's about selecting a good business partner. Um, so when I started Entra, I realized what I'm very good at and what I'm not very good at. And what I'm not very good at is a lot of, like I, I was, I would say this, in previous businesses, I had been adequate at creating systems and processes and maintaining cadences and operational rhythms inside of a corporate or not a corporate. I try never to feel, have anything I do feel corporate, but inside of a functional business environment, um, I tried to 
I, I essentially did that stuff myself, but I knew that for Entra to become what I believed it could be because I recognized the hunger in the world for this type of messaging, I was never going to be able to do that myself. And so, uh, I, I, especially in to, to create the volume, uh, the, the, you know, the serious, to, to commit to the messaging with the level of seriousness that I believed it, uh, it deserved. It's, I will say it's really, really hard to block out all this nonsense about the jar gang. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to scroll the comments down and then I can't read the Instagram comments. But I knew that to commit to doing what I was going to need to do to get Entra out to market at the level that I wanted it to go, I wasn't going to be able to do both. And frankly, there's way better people out there than me in terms of the operation systems and processes of a business. So I read a book called Rocket Fuel. So I was talking to this, uh, talking about this to somebody and they recommended a book called Rocket Fuel. Write it down. Later, Jeff, go do your uh, podcast, man. Love what you're doing. So uh, somebody recommended me this book called Rocket Fuel, and it helped me understand a really, really important paradigm in business between the visionary and the integrator. And I realized I'm a classic business visionary. I love creating messaging, driving the energy and being the day-to-day -day energizer bunny behind the mission of a business. But I, where I, I'm not as strong is on the systems and processes and the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So, and that's what's called the integrator role. So I went out and, and, and I had, fortunately I had relationships in my life. By the way, this is why your network is so important. You're going to realize one day, Hey, I need X. And if you've been diligent about building your network, you'll already have someone in your network who's got X or who's skilled at X. And so for me, I realized I need X. Who do I know? And I, and I accessed, uh, I re-accessed a relationship that I had in my life with somebody that I knew was a great potential integrator. We partnered up and it's why Entra has grown 2000% this year. You know, we didn't even start selling anything. We didn't sell our very first course until summer of last year. It's been 15 months and we've sold almost 60,000 of those courses. That doesn't just happen. That's no accident, right? It's because I paired up with a world-class integrator so that I could focus on my lane, he could focus on his, we could, we could complement each other, and we could scale an amazing business. So I know when you're just starting out, whoa, my phone just crashed. My Instagram phone just crashed and fell off my computer, so well, let's try that again, right? I knew that in order to scale an amazing business, I needed uh, I needed that assistance, and so I found a great partner. That's that's frankly that's what I have to say about finding a great partner, is to understand what you're great at and not try to be great at the things that you're not great at. And if your business requires other things that you're not great at, find a partner, find multiple partners, and that doesn't mean you have to necessarily give them equity in your business or you have to contribute capital to your business. It could be a great vendor. It could be a great agency. It could be a great virtual assistant, but don't try to be great at everything. That's ultimately, I think, the key, you know, to how to find a great business partner. I'm not going to get into the mechanics of, you know, the types of contracts and operating agreements and equity and buy-in and, you know, voting rights and all that stuff. That stuff all matters ultimately. But when you're getting started, I think the best, the thing that's differentiated, well, frankly, so Zerly, my previous business, an agency, we, you know, we made the Inc. 5,000 multiple times, uh, did about $30 million in sales in, in a little under six years. Same thing. I had an operator, a person that ran the operations of that business that allowed me to scale it so much more than I ever would have. And uh, prior to that, I was an affiliate marketer, made good money, but I was very capped in terms of the impact I could have in this world. And ultimately, that lesson has been about how to go out and find the people that can complement you, that have complementary skill sets and allow you to do more than you would ever be able to do on your own. And I think there's a tendency sometimes when we get into starting a business, when we get into entrepreneurship to, to really isolate because a lot of us, we get into starting a business, we get into getting control and empowerment in our life. And because we're having to push away so many previous influences, we're having to, in many ways, withdraw from our previous environment, we kind of get overly committed to this sense of isolation and we forget there are other like-minded people who've been through the same thing in their life and they're seeking partnerships and collaboration too. 
That's why, if anything, that's the one of the huge values of Entra. Inside of Entra Nation, you have over 10,000 people who have all made this decision to kind of pull back from their normal life and create a new life. Those are your potential collaborations, right? And again, it's not all about being true business partners. It's just about finding alignment of skill sets. And, and, and that's why I lean so much on the value of communication. If I hadn't, here's the thing. It was one thing to go, oh, I need help, right? But to be able to attract the people that had those complementary skill sets and to align them with my vision and to get everybody bought in and rowing in the same direction, that was about communication. I had tried previously to collaborate with people and I sucked at it. And the reality was, it wasn't business acumen that got me better at collaboration. It was literally therapy and learning about responsive communication. It was the same skills that I went to learn to be a better father and a better husband that, and I had no idea at the time, that would ultimately translate into allowing me to build great teams that would allow me to build great businesses. So for what it's worth, in terms of circling back to the actual subject of this presentation, I will say... Don't try to be great at everything except and then really, really work on thoughtful and effective communication so that you can go out and not just find people that have the skills that you want to align with, but you can actually speak to them in a way that enrolls them into the vision and the mission of what you're trying to do. Because if you don't accomplish that, partnerships are always destined to fail. This has been a long one. It's six o'clock. I think I'm supposed to be on another meeting. I'm going to go. Thank you. Thank you. Love always. See you tomorrow.